Hey everybody, welcome back to Blood and Still. I'm your host Justin, and I'm here with my main man Jason. What's up guys? And we've got a treat for you tonight. We have the man himself, Mr. Robert Schwab from Schwab Entertainment. Everybody knows him as the creator of Shadow of the Demon Lord. We're happy to have him on. Hey guys, I'm so glad to be here. Cool. Rob, this has been kind of a long time in the making. In fact, when we started the podcast back in January, I told Jason that I want to get Rob on. I want to get him on and talk about his game because I think there's a cool story to tell there. Yeah, definitely. It's uh, It's been a lot of fun learning the system and to be able to now talk to the guy who had some idea, that had the whole idea and concept behind it. It's just going to be a great night. Well, hopefully I won't break any hearts by, uh, you know. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. I'm just, whoops. Oh. <laughs> fine. Rob, let's, let's start with you a little bit. I, I, um, I'm... I just became friends with you on Facebook a little while ago, and uh, your Facebook posts are always entertaining. Um, <laughs> but um, tell us, like, you seem to be old school gamer a little bit. When did you first get into gaming? Uh, it was uh, way back in the mid '80s, late '80s, uh, with the Red Box D and D, uh, and I became a big fan of Dungeons Dragons from that first. Those first days, until my mom told me that uh, Satan was going to get my soul through by playing D and D, totally not understanding that thirteen year old Rob would. There were other better tactics to <laughs> get me over to the dark side than, you know, hang out in a you know, in a in a warm room with smelly boys. Uh, I would have liked the succubus, for example. Yeah. But anyway, <laughs> uh, yeah. So I, so I, I that that led me to play a bunch of other role playing games because I was forbidden from playing D and D. So I got to play all sorts of everything from Twilight 2000 to Marvel superheroes, the whole raft of Palladium games, Rollmaster, Murph, Shadow run. It goes on and on and on. Yeah. So I played, and so by the time I got back to D and D, I had already had, I, I really was really uh, intimately familiar with uh, a raft of role playing games at that point. And so, yeah, that's, it's, and that's pretty much how it's been ever since. It's, so you've tried a lot of different games. Looking back, what would you say was your favorite? What what kind of really called to you the most? I think it was probably – there's a couple. Um, so I'm going to give you a longer answer than probably the question warrants. Uh, but uh, I started – I think my favorite one was Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay First Edition. It just drips flavor. It's so loaded with great content. It's a huge book, and you feel a little squeamish about looking through it because there's all sorts of weird things cooking in there and – Monsters that look familiar to D&D players, but definitely have their own spin. Um, other games that probably grabbed me, there was a, I'm looking for it on my shelf. Uh, it is uh, The Hidden Kingdom. Uh, mm -hmm. Very few people know about this game, but it's a, it's a role-playing game that allows you to play knights in King Arthur's court. And oh. you, play, cool. if you play pre-gen characters, uh, and the more legends and stories and poems and all the other things about those characters there are, the more powerful and the bigger, bigger presence your character has in the in the world, and it has a bit of uh, resource management, and you're protecting your castle, and you're going on quests to chase down the questing beast, tilting lances, and all that other stuff. It's a really simple game, and it was weird because it was in a three ring binder in a slipcase. It came with uh, game science dice, so uh, it was a it was a neat neat thing. <laughs> so those are probably two of my big ones, but there are yeah. other ones. You know, it's funny you mentioned the Warhammer fantasy because as I was going through your book, I was like, "Oh my gosh, this uh, there's a lot of Warhammer in this in this game." You know, in the in the Shadow of the Demon Lord, I, I was just telling Jason, I was like, "Look, there's there's uh, rules for musicians and ba and bannermen in there, you know, and and uh, you know some of the some of the monsters that we encounter are very Warhammer flavored." So, yeah, well, that was kind of the thing that I, I described Demon Lord when I was first trying to sell it a couple of years ago was that it's like, imagine that D and D and Warhammer had an illegitimate baby. And that's, <laughs> and part of that comes from the fact that my uh, design pedigree, I spent a lot of time working on Warhammer fantasy role play and uh, I've seen him at a time working on D and D. And so those were probably my two first lives. So uh, <clears throat> kind of leading into that, um, you said you, you've been doing some work there. How, just as a starting point, how did you get into the gaming industry in terms of not just playing it, but actually being part of the industry? Yeah, uh, so I was at I was uh, just out of college, the second go around, and I was selling uh, flooring, carpet, and hardwood uh, hardwood floors, and that kind of th that, that kind of stuff. 
also selling liquor at a liquor store. Sounds uh, riveting. Yeah, and I was trying to trying to become realize my dreams of being a novelist uh, by not writing books. When <laughs> uh, when a third party D twenty company posted an open call in EN World, and so I tracked down a link and I sent them a bunch of pitches, and they bought two books from me, and that led to me landing a gig with um, Reading Ronin Publishing and Necromancer Games and. Kenzer and Company and AEG and Fantasy Flight. And it just kind of and I eventually landed a job with, uh, with the Ronins, um, as a D20 line developer. And I did that for a number of years. And then I added Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay to my workload. And then I eventually designed a Song of Ice and Fire, uh, roleplaying as the last wow. bit. Yeah. For them. Oh, then, cool. But after that, I think it was 08, maybe I became a, uh, full-time contractor for Wizards of the Coast and was there throughout the life of 4th edition and through the 5th edition development cycle. Cool, very cool. So what uh, what do you like about being in the game industry? Uh, bleh, you know, uh, uh, the glib answer would be, not much! Uh, no. Uh, <laughs> so one thing that's really cool is that uh, the thing that is, well, there's a couple things. One, uh, I would say Getting to meet a lot of my heroes growing up and, you know, that, that, and becoming friends with them, genuinely friends with them was, it's probably one of the most rewarding aspects of the job. I mean, uh, you know, I talk to Monty when I can and Bruce Cordell and Chris Premis and Steve Kenson. It goes on and on. And it's been, I've made a lot of really fantastic friendships that will probably carry with me for the rest of my life. Um, the other thing, of course, is probably the more obvious one is that I get to use my imagination and make cool stuff for, yeah. for games I love. But there's a, you know, there's another side of that, which is this is, it, it's become a job. There's, there's no doubt that d- despite the fact that I can slip in curse words into my manuscripts and, you know, <laughs> uh, and talk about crap monsters and body parts and other gross things, uh, it's still a job. Yeah. I mean, work is work. And people say, do you like, do you like what you do? And, See, so, yeah, I do like what I do, but you know, sometimes work is just work. Yeah. Uh, so on that front, though, I think kind of responding to what you said, uh, that's one of the things I love about tabletop RPG too is just the interaction between the people, getting to meet new people, going to conventions, sitting at the table with people you don't know uh, that you probably are very different personalities with in some regards, but you can still sit at the table and spend four hours together having a good time. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So let me let me turn that question and say, you know. Uh, what are what are some of the the key things you think are difficult about working in the gaming industry? Um, well, part of the thing is you, there's a, c- a couple things. Uh, we my company doesn't have a formal office; it's based out of my house. Uh, I don't have any I don't, I don't have any full time employees. Everyone I work with is contractors, uh, so there's a lot of isolation that comes from the uh, isolation. Okay, and I've been having working. Uh, out of my home for 15, uh, was it 15, 17, 17 years, somewhere in there. Wow. Uh, so I'm kind of used to it and I have, a, I've got a couple of really good bars I go to for my socialization time. Uh, <laughs> but that's, that's pretty much the extent of uh, that. That's deadlines are tough. Um, I kind of look at, uh, I was telling my therapist that what it's like working in this business is that it's like being back in a college and never ever being done with a paper. Mm. As soon as you turn one paper over, you have another one coming up. Yeah, those are some of the more uh, some of the challenges. Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah, I guess like if you're a novelist, right? Like you write a big old long novel. Like there's an end point, and you may get a break for a year or two, unless you've got another, uh, you know, part of the book deal or something like that. But it seems like since your products are a little bit shorter, or quicker turnarounds, that it's just the the flow is is more constant. And it's also difficult because you, there's an issue of trying to stay relevant in the business. Uh, mm. I can't, mm. I can't just, and I, I took the, I, I guess I've not gone to a convention since March. And partly that's because I, the last two and a half years, I traveled 29 weeks, uh, for shows and other wow. stuff like that. So, uh, but I feel like by not going out there and just putting my face in front of people and running games means that I'm kind of drifting off into the background and I really just can't afford to do that. Yeah, well, we'll keep running the games for you, man. Hail. I appreciate yeah. it, too. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Yeah, in fact, we're planning, I think I told you this, we're planning to go to a catacon in November. Awesome. We're going to be We're going to be running a couple sessions, and even we're planning to do a panel on horror and the RPGs and uh, 
you know, how that kind of relates with the Shadow of the Demon Lord system that we like to run. So, yeah, that sounds yeah. good. And that's a yeah. great show, too. Those are great. All those okay. guys over at Account of Con are fantastic. Yep. Uh, and I tell you, um, it's good to get out there and run games because just even just today there was a post on the uh, Facebook group. One of the guys that was in my sessions, he says, "Hey, I want to run, I want to run that session that we did at Gen Con with my group." So it's like you know, it's this expanding amoeba system that just spreads itself out into the industry. Yeah, very much. Yep. Like door to door, it's like selling encyclopedias door to door though. Sometimes, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You maybe know, a little more interesting, maybe. Yeah, it's but, certainly more yeah. interesting. But uh, you know, I think about like go to a convention, and I, you know, if I'm running five slots over the weekend, I'm lucky. If I'm lucky, I've talked to 25 people. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's and you know that's a huge investment of time to just potentially sell 25 copies of the core book. So I'm trying to find a better way to do that. So having ambassadors out there like you guys, it certainly helps take some of the pressure off. Yeah, I'll tell you another thing that takes a lot of the pressure off, uh, or maybe pressure off for you, but also pressure off for the the consumers, us us gamers, is that you the concept that you have with Shadow of the Demon Lord, where there's like the core rule book, and then there's just all these little supplements that like don't break the bank to buy. It's like yeah. I could just go pay a buck fifty on Drive Through RPG and have another like you know four hours of entertainment. Like the return on investment for that is just amazing. That's been that was the whole plan all along was to try to keep uh, just try to keep all sorts of things out there that because you know the thing is, is that you, you, it, it's a little bit more expensive than having a subscription to Dragon Magazine back in the day but the point is is that you know these are all relatively cheap and expensive things that you're yeah. gonna that hopefully will make make your excite your imagination and and lead to more than just putting it on the shelf right you, you'll use it yeah. I mean, that's the price of like a uh, extra large soda, you know, at a fast food restaurant. So it's not even, it's just nothing. I don't even think about it. It's great. Versus having to pay, you know, twenty nine ninety nine for the latest, uh, you know, campaign expansion to other systems. But anyways, it's much easier to get into and to expand my uh, library. Awesome. So, so you know, you talked a little bit about being a contractor with uh, Ronin, uh, doing Wizards of the Coast type of thing, but um, what really made you want to do Shout of the Demon Lord, really create your own system? Uh, so I, this was not the first. Uh, you'll have to forgive me. I, so is my big bugaboo word. I try not to say it, but it comes out of my <laughs> we head. Have, we oh. have a list, by the way. We have sticky notes that we put yeah. out that we're not allowed to They're say. They're all over the place. Okay. Whenever, but, whenever we find ourselves saying too, that word too much, we put it on the sticky note and put it on Definitely, the, yeah. absolutely, yep. right. Yeah, we've, yep. got, we've got it. Good, good, good. All right, well, I will tighten up the belt around my, around my leg. <laughs> That'll help remind me. All right, anyway, so <laughs> anyway, the reason why I decided to uh, design Demon Lord was because I had already designed several games before 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 that. Uh and in every other case, they're usually collaborations. Um, when I worked on A Song of Ice and Fire, uh, it was uh, kind of a company decision as far as what kind of game engine we would use uh, for that game. You know, I got to design a lot of I, – I, I, it was still basically the game that, I, that came out of my head. But uh, there were – the direction that I went were, was, a, was a direction that I probably wouldn't have gone initially. The same thing is true for the stuff that uh, – for supplements I did for Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay. Uh, for stuff I did on D&D for 3.5 and 4th, and of course, uh, the grand collaboration that was 5th uh, edition D&D. All of these games are just a lot of people coming together and putting their minds uh, in, uh, in the same room and trying to find some sense of agreement about how a game should develop as, as you're going. Uh, so I had very clear and concrete ideas about what I thought was what I wanted to do, uh, and Demon Lord was kind of my answer to all right, now I'm unchained. I can do whatever I want. Let me just make the game that I want to run. Mm-hmm. And so that's why I took the big. I took the. Uh, I, I rolled the dice, and you know we were able to. We were able to pull it off with a Kickstarter, and uh, and it's been a pretty good run so far. So. Yeah, I think so. But it was really just mostly just kind of to say that I wanted to do something that was completely mine. I mean, I think every person kind of gets to that point in their life, right, where they say, okay, I've, I've done so much for others. I've, like, learned. I've helped other companies grow. I've helped uh, other people make a buck. Like, I kind of want to build my own right. thing, you know, my, my own two hands thing. But, um, yeah, I mean, uh, well, when you were creating Shadow of the Demon Lord, um, what what do you think or like are, were its greatest strengths? Like, what do you think is the, the strongest aspect about about the system? 
Uh, I think, I, you know, not looking at anything else that we've done for Demon Lord and just looking at the core book alone, I think the biggest things are, uh, is the sen- is the fact that I've empowered game masters and players to just tell cool stories and getting out of the way, get, getting the mechanics out of the way from just letting the story evolve in wh- whatever way it should. Uh, initiative system is one of the things I'm really proud of because mm-hmm. it mm-hmm. completely streamlines uh, the transition from narrative to tactical without having to do any kind of mechanical uh, uh, mechanical front work. Um, a compacted campaign where your characters are leveling up after story completions or story goals rather than having to accumulate a certain number of dead bodies, yeah. gold pieces. <laughs> uh, yeah. And still making the game and, and doing, and, and, you know, Boons and Banes was another big thing. I mean, we're only talking mechanics that, are, that, that got me hot and bothered, but these are the areas <laughs> where... I was really trying to innovate, but also wanted to do to present a game that was familiar to players of, of role playing games. I could have done, I could have built a game that uses percentile dice or uh, or d12s or a reference table or something along those lines. But what I really wanted to do was I wanted to say, "Hey, folks, you know what a role playing game is. Let's not try to make this hard for you. Let's try to make this easy. Play the game the way you know how to. You, we normally would play the game, but with a lot, but without all the BS that makes mm-hmm. it." Yeah. You know, it's funny you, you um, kind of mentioned the percentile or reference tables because there seems to be an explosion right now. I mean, I know Monty Cook Games is putting out, you know, the Numenera and the Cypher system, and that's kind of real hot right now. And uh, we played Cthulhu the other day at Gen Con, and that was a percentile dice. And, uh, you know, I mean, there are, there are good systems in their own right, but I'll tell you what, sitting down with some of the folks – and rolling a D20 with a couple of D6s, it just felt familiar, you know, to people. Like I did, just as a quick anecdote, for one of my sessions, uh, I had a, we had Saturday morning 8 a.m. at Gen Con, which, you know, it's a little early for some people. And one of, one of my, uh, guys, uh, his group showed up, but they said they couldn't get him out of bed. So he ended up rolling in at 11 a.m. when the session started at 8. So he'd missed the first three hours of the game. And he sat down fully expecting just to kind of sit and watch. But I slapped a character sheet in front of him, and I said, this is how you quickly play it, literally like a three-minute discussion. And next thing I know, he's throwing fire bolts. He's doing, you know, calling out fast and slow initiative. Like, he was totally engaged. Awesome. You yeah. know, and, I mean, it was so fast, so easy. And, I, I mean, personally, that's what I love more than anything about this game is its simplicity. I don't have to do math a lot of the time. Yeah, but, you would- know. <laughs> yeah, that was the number one um, common comment by everybody at my tables, at our tables, I think, at Gen Con was they would finish and they would, they would go, wow, that was fun. They would go, wow, this system is really fast to play. I said, yeah, a lot of times you're used to kind of a D&D where it's a very tactical game. You know, it can be a very tactical game. So you get down, all right, roll initiative, and then you're in combat. And you can have a 45 to an hour and 15 minute long combat encounter depending on the complexity of the players. But everybody – sits down with this one and it's okay fast turns done slow turns done fast turns done slow turn and you know you can get through it you can get through an encounter in 20 minutes and not only are you just rolling dice and and playing the mechanics which are fun at times but it feels it feels like a narrative the whole time you're having the the combat encounter yeah everyone everyone commented about how good that was awesome yeah like the one of the i've I've found in my running my own games when i'm not you know tired uh, I find that it's, it, the, the combat structure allows for a lot of uh, description of what's going on. Yeah. You don't worry about uh, fiddly rules that will that will get in the way. Uh, and and it's, one of the other things I also enjoy is when players see the trickery uh, uh, talent for the rogue, mm-hmm. always describe how they're tricking their opponent. So they're either throwing sand in their face or they're saying, what in the world could that be? And <laughs> they try, they try to find ways to kind of really... Yeah themselves with this just really simple mechanic which i thought was a lot of fun my favorite is when the players who had never played it before started realizing they could create synergies with themselves yeah you know like i'm gonna push this guy down the stairs and you're just gonna bash his head in at the bottom you know and i'm like throw some extra boons in there because you guys are working together you know so uh it was really cool to see like you know you expect these people to start working as a team you know, and it feels like you can do that more when you're not in a rigid initiative structure. Yeah, absolutely. You know, where it's like you go, and then I have to wait for two monsters, and then I'll go. You know, yeah. but they'll have already moved, so we can't really create anything. So yeah, it's very cool. 
It's funny, it's funny though, because you, I think back to when I was learning how to play D and D the first time with Red Box and then Advanced D and D. That's how we played back in the day, where we didn't really worry about, you know, do I have this particular widget that gives me a plus two bonus from standing next to a wall, or I've got this other widget that lets me do this other thing with a combo of this other thing of a combo of that other thing that breaks the game. We didn't worry about that. The most the, the 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 sketchiest thing you could do was two weapon fighting in second edition D and D, and that was that was pretty much it until unless you started stacking spells. But uh, you know, I just think about how we could just make up whatever we wanted, and the rules were there to kind of keep you going. But you generally the game dungeon master game master had the freedom to just kind of adapt to the story as it develops, and that's kind of what I'm really really passionate about trying to bring back to gaming tables, where we're not so much worried about. Uh, keeping our heads in our character sheets, but rather looking up at each other, mm -hmm. talking and telling yeah. cool, cool stuff. I have a, uh, since we've been talking about initiative, I have a question for you about your intentions behind monsters in the initiative system. Sure. So there's, there's fast turns and slow turns, right? And typically, if you have a monster that is not super cognitive, you know, they pretty much always... You always have them take fast turns. It's just like they, they're either hitting you if you're near them or they're going to you so they can hit you. Uh, so what is your feelings on when it's appropriate for monsters to take slow turns? And the reason I ask is because when a monster – monster is not really the right word, right? When the bad guy or the, the opposing person. When they take a slow turn, it's actually very powerful for them because if, let's say that you got you – got we had this situation happen recently. We had all the players took slow turns. But then three really big baddies took slow turns as well, and they went after the players. Yeah, well, I think that you've got to think about what the monster's motivation or the creature, the adversary's motivation is for the particular scene. I think if you've got demons, they have a pretty high intellect score. They're gonna they're they're gonna do whatever they can do that, that to to win. Uh, yeah. But if you're fighting a pack of just general uh, run of the mill monsters, yeah, they're gonna attack fast every time because yeah. they're just probably feed me uh, or. <laughs> It, that's pretty. That's pretty much it, right? Yeah. Um, I also think that I'd also encourage people to, uh, you know, one of the things I, I I've also do a lot of my games is I wrap up fights when they stop being interesting. I am not. I am not above. I, I don't think there's anything wrong with having the characters fight a bunch of zombies and you get down to one or two and then just describe them killing the last zombies and moving on. Mm -hmm. I think yeah. That's totally fine, uh, and that's part of it. Because the monsters have the numbers they have because that's how they're balanced and that's, that's how the math plays out. But, you know, uh, tables, tables change. Uh, every, every, no, no plan survives encounter with the enemy, right? So uh, I think that it's best for uh, looking at monsters as kind of a guideline as far as the numbers go and then adapting to the circumstances uh, as, as they unfold. But uh, as far as uh, having monsters go slow, yeah, it can be really nasty. Especially if you have it, you've got monsters lurking, waiting in the wings that are yeah. waiting slow to come out and then pound the characters. Yeah, <laughs> that's exactly what happened. It ended yeah. up wrecking our clockwork. Oh, uh, poor clockwork. <laughs> yeah, it was funny because he went down, and there were two more, and all the players looked at each other at the, the table and like, "Does anyone have anything they can do?" And we're like, "We've already all gone." <laughs> 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 Sorry. Yeah, them. That's yeah. all right. I'm the GM for our group, so I, I wrecked him, and I didn't feel bad about it. Nope. Just rolled another character. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> Luckily, it's making a... characters for the game are pretty, it's pretty easy. Oh, super easy. Yeah. That's another thing. You can, spin, you can turn around and within five minutes. I think within five minutes he had another character he was ready to roll. We were at the end of the night, but he had another one he was ready to pull up. Awesome. So good stuff. So, Rob, what's your favorite supplement that you've, uh, that you've made? Uh, Hunger in the Void. Oh, that's one of my favorites. Yeah, I was. That book was. It was one of the last ones I uh, I did for the the first Kickstarter. And man, there were some moments in there in the writing of that that I would be I would make myself sick, uh, and I would just kind of have to say I, I can't do this anymore, and I'd just take off and go have a few drinks down at the watering hole. Um, so it took a little longer to make, but it there's some really nasty things in there, uh, and I. I and it really kind of captures the level of gross and grotesque that I really kind of aim for when I run the game. I, you know, I like it for, you know, the whole lore of the, of the void and the demon Lord. And I mean, 
just the explanations of why these things are happening on in this world, I thought were so good for background as a GM. You know, so that when players start to encounter something, and I'm like, uh, just that knowledge of the hunger and the void yeah. is like, well, it's because of this. And like, oh, okay, that makes sense. <laughs> you know, so this is why this is so messed up. <laughs> yeah, was, yeah. I it, it was a, it was, it was kind of intentional the, how I revealed a lot of the setting secrets through the supplements because, you know, we find out in Ter- Terrible Beauty that the, the 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 elf folks are lords and ladies are probably most likely the old gods right. and then we find out in exquisite agony the devil's actually you know the new god and that's so uh, a lot of people get mad about that for some reason but anyway and then spoiler yeah sorry kids uh, there was a there was a whole string I'm not kidding a day ago on the Discord chat um, for Shadow of the Demon Lord where some people were really ticked off by that. <laughs> you know, and it's like, dude, this is the lore. I mean, it like, you know, yeah. and and the thing is, is, is you kind of like you, we, so you pulled back the curtain a little bit and you see like, this is the true origins. It doesn't make it any more myth for the people that live in your, in your world. Like 99.9% of the people probably don't realize this. Oh, right. You know? <laughs> it's, it's not like, the, it's not like Diabolus comes up and says, Hey, I'm your man. Uh, yeah. <laughs> he's, he's, it, it, it would be it, it's not good for him and, and, and most of those people who serve the new god you know they're not going to be corrupted generally yeah. so they don't have anything to worry about and they're just going to go to the underworld like everybody else but it strengthens Diabolus makes him more powerful and gives him a stronger presence in the world yeah I thought it works I, I think it was deliciously <laughs> awful so yeah yeah, I think Exquisite Agony and Hunger in the Void are, like, my two favorite. But I'm going to be honest with you, the um, Bread for Battle, the Orcs one. Oh, yeah. Oh, man. That was, a, that was a piece of work. When I was reading that and, like, reading how, like, the whole drudge thing happened and the whole farms up north, I'm like, wow, this is a <laughs> lot of good material. This is great. Yeah. Yeah, good stuff. I think um... – just from a player's perspective, for me, Uncertain Faith is probably my favorite just because there's so much good content that helps you understand what it means to be a priest in, uh, in, the, on, in Earth. And it's just, it's really helped drive my priest. My priest has bounced between, he was first a, a priest of the Dark Lady, and he actually had a, I don't know what you call it, but he, he had, you know, some sort of turning moment in his life in our campaign where he switched over and now he's actually a priest of Father Death. And there was kind of a pretty epic switch for that to happen that really happened offline between me and the GM. And I showed up one day to the table and all of a sudden I was playing my character differently and everyone's kind of looking around like, what? Why is he acting differently? Or, you know, you don't look as pasty as you used to, you know, look at those kinds of things. But I, so I really like Uncertain Faith. I think there's a lot of good content for any player that wants to play a priest in there. Thank you. I love that. That was a, that for some reason that book was the hardest for me to make of all that it was just I, I really I don't know what I don't know what happened I, I remember really struggling through parts of that but I, I feel like it was a good product so yeah. yeah so so we've listened to your podcast a little bit the Rob's Basement podcast oh, sorry and, but, no <laughs> I, you know and, and, and this is the thrust of my question is when you made this game for me to listen to your podcast it's interesting because I feel like you run it the way you intended it to. Um, but do you feel like that that's generally how it should be, kind of fast and deadly, just c- kind of keep moving, keep rolling? You know, you, you get through things pretty quick. Yeah, I don't – well, I mean, part of the thing is that we only play for a couple of hours, and I'm usually pretty drunk by the time we start. <laughs> uh, and, you know, I, for a while there, I, I, I was really, really burned out. Um so there is kind of a no nonsense approach to to running, uh, sort of. I, I don't think the way I run, I would recommend it for everybody. I think yeah. that you should take more time to develop your characters and and really engage the story and hopefully not have characters named uh, was it Grinder? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he was a clockwork. It made sense. <laughs> right, right. And you know, and if you're a game master, you probably not, you might not want to experiment with root vegetable blindness, but. Uh, Saul, Saul, oh, Saul. <laughs> but you know, I, I also like the fact that you can run Demon Lord like an Evil Dead game, right? Where it's just yep. Wahoo, bizarre, whatever crazy thing that you'd expect to happen, and then a bunch more that you don't expect. 
And I think that's fun. I think there's just a, like I've run, I've run games, uh, Demon Lord, where it's, it's really, really uncomfortable and, but everyone's in, but it, even I'm a little creeped out about what happens. I, there was one time I ran it at a Memphis convention and this nine year old girl's playing the game and I've been trying to kind of rein it in. Yeah. Uh, she, she's playing a changeling. She murders the tavern keeper, the, the tavern owner. Uh, in the alley after seducing him somehow. And then she takes his form and then takes over the business. And I think she murders the wife. It just was really weird. She might have been 11. I don't know. It, <laughs> was, really, it was an 8 o'clock game and I was a little hungover. Were so, her parents at the table? Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, that's one way to raise your kids. Their pride and joy. Yeah. <laughs> but everybody had a really good time. It was good. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure I would let my uh, 11-year-old play Shadow of the Demon. I'm, I'm just saying, you know. I... Well, yes, there, you know, there, there will be a, a more PG uh, version of the game coming out eventually. So Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so my 11-year-old 11-year, uh, uh, was looking over my shoulder as I first got the book, and her favorite aspect were the goblins and all the uh, background characteristics for it. She especially liked the part where, the one of the quirks was that you like to, you know, play with your feces after after you were done. <laughs> she thought that was pretty funny. Yeah. <laughs> my uh, my four or five year old, she she likes to come up to me and point at the book and say, "I'm not afraid, Daddy." And I just look at her and I go, "Oh, you will be <laughs> if I open this book anymore." Yeah, but good, good yeah. stuff. So here, let me let me present a question to you. Sure. Uh, that a lot of people have asked me when I talk about Shadow. Um, I they. I'll explain the system, I'll talk about how fun it is, and they'll say, why should I play Shadow the Demon Lord instead of just D&D in a horror setting? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. But uh, one, one that I can give you an answer for that's politically uh, uh, right. better than any other reason. I'd uh, like both, please, the political, and then uh, switch over to the non-political. Yeah, so I think the biggest thing is, is that uh, you can – D and D makes a promise that you're going to play a campaign that will last. They'll take you from level one to whenever it ends, and that might be. And you can see this showing up in every giant campaign source book that comes out for for the game. And those are great books. They're a lot of fun, and a lot of talented people worked on those books. They're gorgeous. They're beautiful. But they don't. I don't know how you can do it. I don't know how you can be a grown up in the world today and commit to two, three years of playing yeah. the same campaign. I can't get the same five to six people to show up my house two weeks in a row. Yeah. Uh, I can't get the same group of people to show up every other month. So Demon Lord just kind of says, screw that. You know, you can, you can get together and play a campaign in 11 sessions. Each adventure that we publish, you can playable in one sitting, maybe two, maybe two. Uh, and if you can do that, you play, you've had the full role playing experience in a compressed time. You would see your character grow from uh, super fragile to becoming pretty badass by the end. You so it's interesting you mentioned that because, uh, you know, I, I think uh, – I, well, I play a D&D 5e game right now, like a month a game with a, my friend. And uh, I always look forward to more of our Shadow of the Demon Lord games than our D&D ones. I, we're playing Out of the Abyss right now. And, again, it's a little bit on rails. But, you know, to me, the, the more – it feels a little bit more vanilla to me. It doesn't feel as complex. Like it, it seems a little bit uh, simple in terms of like, here's your preset background. Here's what you got, you know? And um, I mean, a good, a good GM obviously will weave a lot of those backgrounds into the story and, and maybe make some things up with it. But if you're working out of those sets, there's not a lot of like, Hey, here's a side quest that you can go do and, yeah. And, you know, make your own campaign. Obviously, um, you can homebrew D&D &D all you want and, and stuff like that. But to me, I feel like the complexity and maybe the nuances of society and just the system in general allows you to have more of that rich role playing experience that I, I don't know if I get it with D&D. &D. Yeah. The other, the other thing you're talking about, kind of the, well, one of the things that also kind of um, I have a hard time with with uh, the current edition is that and this is, again, no slight against it. Once you make your decisions on your character, once you've made your background, once you made your background choice, your race choice, your class choice, there's very little you decide that going forward, unless you avail yourself of feats and multi-classing rules. So there's not a lot of character development outside of the story you're, you're weaving around your character. And for some people who are casual players, that's great. But I, 
But I like to have a little customization. I like to make decisions about how my characters can develop. And I think uh, I think Merle's posted a, a tweet the other day where he was talking about how third and fourth edition were all about character optimization and putting these pieces together. And so there's a game you're playing in your head, and I'm unpacking this for him, and I want to put those words in his mouth. But I'm, this is my interpretation of what he was saying, is that I think there are games, I think those editions had games in themselves, which was the Magic the Gathering style, where you're kind of building the perfect character, you're building the perfect deck of cards to play. And I don't think they made those games bad. I just think it changed how we play D&D from second to, to third and fourth. But I think it's really hard to put that genie back in the bottle once people have had the options to say, you know, I'm, my, my character is going to develop in a way that I can't expect. And, you know, there are going to be people who want to plan out their character from level one all the way to 20. Um, but I think it's really more interesting to say, you know, my character is a fighter, but uh, I've been hanging out with this rogue all this all this time. And I'm really getting the sneaky thing, so I'm going to take a level in Rogue. Well, I'm to go through a bunch of hoops to do that. And so that's kind of why Demon Lord's uh, path system lets you make those decisions at key points in your character's career. You're, you can go and do the route of, you just want to be a guy who swings the swords and hits and kills things, that's fine. We've got paths all the way through that game for you. But if you want to mix and match and combine and have a really interesting character that reflects the narrative, hell yeah, right? I mean, that's that's what I think it should be doing. And, you know, so I, I don't know that there's – I don't think that some of the options you get from uh, character development and, and the other game uh, are enough to kind of hook me for a, a full campaign, especially 20 levels. Yeah, so you – so on that on that thought there, right, so we talked about how you can play – you can sit down and you play Shadow in 11 sessions from level 0, basically, to level 10. Do we have any thoughts in the future on moving past level 10? <sighs> yeah, no. Um, it all depends on how things go in November, um, and I, I'll come back to that in a second. But uh, we had a early, early on. I had a product in mind called Legends of the Demon Lord, where you would be able to take your characters above uh, level ten. Uh, and I, and the idea was that you don't, your character doesn't go on missions really anymore after you finish your uh, your level ten adventure because you're already a badass at this point. You're kind of grounding yourself in the world. So the plan was always that <clears throat> once your group finishes your last adventure, you create a new group, and those player ca those characters that are in the group would have patrons of the previous players player characters that were in the thing. So if I play a magician uh, and I might be apprenticed to the scary arc you know scary arc mage in the, from the previous campaign, I become his agent. And so as your lower level characters are advancing, they're nudging up your higher level characters up to the upper level the upper mm. edge. Um, it could happen. Uh, there's uh, in occult philosophy, we have spells uh, that go from rank, go all the way to rank ten, um, and the expectation is that there may be rules that give us more legendary play. But we'll see. You know, it's funny you mention that because in our campaign, uh, through chance, our group ended up taking over a keep, their own keep, and actually, we're playing the Stars Refuge game. Okay. And uh, the people in the keep decided to go into the refuge. Oh, so wow. they're like, uh, go in there, scout it out for us, and if it's good, uh, you can have our keep. So our group was like, yeah, go ahead, go in, it's fine. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, there's nothing wrong. It's a beautiful place. It's, it's a great place. For everyone. <laughs> totally fine. Yeah. Totally fine, yeah. So anyway. The Meanwhile, we're closing the gates and locking the key, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. So uh, – so uh, uh, the discussion that I've been having with a couple of the players is, all right, well, this is a place to call home. This is where they want to kind of set up. And the long-term plan is basically once they get to level 10, I mean, they own the keeps. So they're going to get some apprentices just as you were just as you were talking about. So I'll, I'll be honest. I'll be the first one to sign up for Kickstarter if you ever come up with that. Sure. Because that's the way our campaign's going. <laughs> I kind of think that you – I know the one thing, though, is I think that – the focus of Demon Lord is really on those 11 adventures, really is kind of focused on seeing your character develop and kind of fighting things at that scale. One of the things that I always puzzled me with, uh, high, you know, really high-level games is how the opposition actually fits into the world. <clears throat> I mean, you expect a Titan could be, could be existing in D&D land somewhere or the Tarrasque or whatever else. But once the game starts having to accommodate super powerful monsters, 
like a devastation beetle. Where the hell has that been? And how come it's running? How come it's never, you know, we haven't seen it until just now. Uh, Make an arcana roll to see if you recognize it. Right. So <laughs> I, I kind of the as I've, as the game's gotten longer in the tooth, I'm kind of of the opinion that, you know, maybe we just don't worry about it. Maybe that's maybe the stories that we tell about characters who do do manage to keep that keep that castle, they become figures of power, and they're going to be there will be people the characters the other characters interact with, but their story is kind of done, right? I mean, maybe. I don't know. That's, Maybe you take them out for a spin every now and then, but uh, yeah. And if you really want to go crazy, badass, high level stuff, you could always use uh, the uh, Paragon and Forbidden Rules. Yeah, right. Well, right. I I tell you, I think I'm kind of of the opinion that once you hit level ten, you're kind of done with the character. Because one of the appeals to me about Shadow of the Demon Lord is the feeling like every time I turn around, I'm going to die, most likely. Right. And if I'm level ten, I'm not gonna. I don't have that same sense of you know. Um, the world's against me, or the world could actually take me down. And I like that feeling of being able to die. So I almost, once I hit 10, it's like, all right, let's start over. Let's roll some, level, you know, back to level zero and do a whole new uh, whole new adventure. So so that feeling that you're always going to die is one of the things that actually really attracted me to Shadow of the Demon Lord, mostly because uh, my decisions have consequence now. Mm-hmm. If I don't run, I might die. Right, I feel like uh, if you play Star, we talked about this in one of our previous podcasts. But if you sp- if you play like Star Wars, for example, there, it's impossible to die in FFG Star Wars FFG. Like the what? rules Fairly don't even impossible. allow you to die, you know. So, um, it, but here it's like, well, I mean, you're gone, and that's how it is. And the GM's unapologetic about it, and <laughs> you know, it's just kind of right. how how it goes. Uh, but what what also interested me is. Uh, we touched on this a little bit. You said, you know, why play Shadow of the Demon Lord versus D and D in a horror setting? We talked about, you know, Shadow of the Demon Lord versus D and D, but like, what really drove you to get to that horror setting of this uh, of this system? You know, it's it stands out a little bit more because horror is not. You've, you've got kind of the Cthulhu horror, which is a little bit different, but uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I, it it kind of taps into uh, where I'm most, the things I'm most interested in. I like uh, really heavy, extreme music. Uh, so like Behemoth and um, Mayhem and a lot of the really Norwegian and uh, Scandinavian black metal acts. Love all that stuff. That's Jason, right up Jason's alley, by yeah. the way. <laughs> Are you an Emperor fan? Oh, yeah. Okay, good. All right. We're, yes. in, the, we're in the same boat. All right, cool. <laughs> <laughs> so... Uh, you know, I I kind of want to play in a game world where you see people wearing corpse paint and riding scary horses and doing terrible things. I mean, I, that's that's my thing, right? I want to. It's not. I don't just want Dio to be singing in the background. I want guttural, brutal, you know, ultra violent music. Uh, I'm also a big horror movie fan, and I've always, even when I ran D and D, I would always have uh, my games were always edgier than. Then I think whatever the baseline is, my goblins had, you know, they had alarming characteristics or, uh, you know, uh, I would be overly descriptive about what happens when a character gets pulped. Uh, and it just, yeah, I think it's, it's fun. And people play Diablo and that's a horror fantasy. Yeah. Game. Yeah. They love I, that part of that. So I, yeah. I kept telling Jason, I want to start, when we start this podcast, I want to talk about, you know, things that are culturally out there like Diablo that seems to just mesh thematically with this game you know um i think the i think the witcher i know they just came out with their rpg but like the witcher world um really i've been pulling a lot from that i've read all their books one of them was a french translation from polish because that's the only way i could get it but anyway (laughs) yeah um you know the the witcher world to me was you know that kind of dark edgy like these are uh fairy tales gone wrong Right, type yeah. thing, you know, so um, that, that I, I really like that uh, about it. So, what? by the way, what's your favorite horror movie? Uh, uh, In the Mouth of Madness. Oh, wow, okay. I think that's my favorite. It is right now, at least. Have you, uh, have you been watching the um, Castle Rock series on Hulu? No, I, I'm, I'm drowning in TV right now, and so I, <laughs> I can't 
I'm still trying to get caught up in Cloak and Dagger uh, and Preacher and Fear of the Walking Dead. And I've got, yeah, it's just I've got too many things to watch. Yeah. There's a lot out there. But I will. It's on my list. I will watch. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, we want to wrap this up uh, by kind of hitting on the topic about what's in the future, what's coming. I know we touched on a little bit. Um, but we want to talk kind of about Schwalb Entertainment and, you know, where you're going over the next six months, year, three years, that type of thing. Well, hopefully not rehab. Uh, but, <laughs> uh, so if I don't go to rehab, uh, then we've got some really cool things coming up. Um, uh, and so on November 12th, I'm launching our third Kickstarter, uh, and it is called Shadow of the Demon Lord Occult Philosophy. And it has two goals. Uh, one is to release the occult philosophy book and two to get us a, a second print run of the core book. Problem is, is that I spent about 18 months working on uh, occult philosophy, uh, but I only have 161 copies of Shadow of the Demon Lord in the warehouse and you got to have the core book to be able to use occult philosophy. Mm. So, uh, the plan is that we're going to do, uh, we're going to use this Kickstarter to do both. Uh, to fund the print run and then also uh, get a new book. Now, as far as the print run goes, these books, this is not a second edition of the game, uh, but what it will do is we'll have a new uh, forward. It's going to use some new art uh, to kind of change out the things and kind of reflect the broader diversity of the uh, Demon Lord world after we have all these other releases. Uh, we're going to probably have a new character sheet and a number of other little kind of fun things will go in the book, but it'll still, but the pagination will be the same fully compatible, and you don't have to get it at all. You can still just get occult philosophy uh, as part of the deal. So that's uh, November 12th. Uh, but So let me let me ask you this real quick. Um, we will be at a Catacon that weekend. Okay. Uh, do you have any, like, marketing materials that you're going to be planning to put out that we might be able to take with us? Uh, yeah, I could probably do something like that, yeah. Yeah, hook us up, because, um, like, even if it's just a little hand flyer or something like that that we could – Give folks to let them know the Kickstarter is starting like the next day, basically. Okay. Um, I, I I know I'd be happy to hand those out for you. All right, I will get some flyers made up and I'll mail you a stack. Cool. Sweet. Um, but the bigger, but you know, uh, about this Kickstarter thing, this is kind of like my big final push for Shadow of the Demon Lord. Uh, if we the Kickstarter does well, I get to do everything I want to do for this game, and so we'll see. Uh, I've got some titles that I want to put in the stretch goals that include The Return of the Witch King. So Asher Call is coming back. That was awesome. a big plan. And uh, there's a Men of Gog source book I want to do, which gives you the, the deep history of what where these assholes came from and why they're so scary. Uh, and how the setting changes when Asher Call comes returning out of the north mm -hmm. uh, to reconquer the Empire. Uh We've got a book called Unspeakable Things, which is a big bestiary of full, of full of all sorts of nasty things that I also want to do. But we're also going to do stuff like uh, modern plugins, like a, like a source book that lets you play more modern style games, and then a science fiction plugin book, um, Tales of Terrible Beauty, Tales of Exquisite Agony. All these things are kind of locked in this thing. So uh, the base stuff is going to be fun, and, you know, Occult Philosophy gives you, adds 800 spells to your game, so who doesn't want that? But uh, and these stretch goals make this pretty sexy. You know, I think another thing that might um, that uh, might might be good good for the system in general is we played we play tested the uh, the board game several oh, months yeah. ago. And gosh, what's the, what's it called? I can't remember. Uh, against the shadow. Yeah, thanks. Against the shadow. Yeah, and we had a lot of fun. We really enjoyed the mechanics behind it. Um, and I tell you, board games are big right now. Yeah. Um. That kind of uh, that you know that kind of a uh, um, the system wrapped around a good board game that had a fun mechanic. Um, it might it, it, I think it's not necessarily difficult to get a board game kickstarted nowadays, especially if it has good artwork and a good setting. Right, and we yeah. uh, against the shadow have gone undergone some massive massive revisions, uh, and we're going to be launching another play, round of playtesting for that. Uh, okay, it's going to be it's. It's a much different game, has fewer components, brings our cost down, which is the biggest problem we had with that game was just yeah. production costs were going to be on all the dice and the miniatures and tokens. and. Yeah, I think it took us like two hours to cut out every little token and thing we were going to use in the game. And then we had like four tables for what all the different dice were going to mean. And it was <laughs> yeah. definitely a little burdensome, but it was fun when we got into it. It was fun. So 
stay tuned for the for the next one. I think we're going to do okay. that. That will go. I think we're going to probably have that play test round launch. Uh, maybe a week or two, and that'll go for 30 days. And then I think the plan is that for March of next year, we'll launch the okay. Against the Shadow Kickstarter. Cool. And then in, Ju- in June of next year, we'll launch the Punk Apocalyptic uh, Kickstarter, which is a new post-apocalyptic game that's full campaign setting, new tweaks to the De- Demon Lord rule set. Uh, it's going to be fun. Nice. Yeah, I just picked up the Punk Apocalyptic. They had a sale on Drive Through RPG and uh, said this, you know, this has a lot of potential. So I, I think I'd love to see, uh, you know, a little bit more expansion on that. It'd be kind of cool. cool. Yeah, very good. Now I know that you also threw your weight behind um, this current Kickstarter that's out there right now for the uh, the Monster Bestiary. Oh, uh, Death and Decay. By, yeah, uh, yeah. Those are from the same folks who uh, translated Demon Lord into Italian. Okay. They started a new imprint to do officially licensed Demon Lord content, and I'll have an eyeball on the stuff they do. Uh, it looks like a lot of fun, and they've got uh, we use a lot of the same artists, so you'll see people like Matteo Spirito and uh, Mirko Paganesi and uh, Biagio di Alessandra and others. <laughs> that'll be you've seen Demon Lord books will be over there too. So it'll be really cool. Yeah. 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 Very cool. It, you know, it looks like they've hit some of their stretch goals, which unlocks some pretty awesome, awesome uh, content. Yeah, they've got a bunch of stuff now. So it looks like uh, they're it's it's it turned out well for them. I think they only got like another twenty four hours left on it as of right now. So yeah, it's, it's I'm really happy. I'm happy with how they, how well they've done, and I'm excited that uh, to see what they can pull together. Um, and I think also we have uh, there was the Embers setting uh, that has a Demon Lord supplement coming out with that, which will be a conversion uh, the game mechanics for that that book. Mm-hmm. And also, Mike Myler has uh, got his Kickstarter running right now for a Demon Lord expansion for his setting. I think it was his book of vile stuff. Uh, yeah. Was that the um, Mists of Akuma? Right. That was, that's right. He did the Mists of Akuma, and he's got another one running right now. Okay. I'm an asshole for not finding it. Anyway, yeah. So there's a lot of stuff out there for Demon Lord, <laughs> and more to come. I mean, that's really great. So the, the last question I think that we'll leave you with is, uh, what can we do as a community to kind of help this grow? Uh, I think the best thing to do is just keep singing its praises and telling people just the more people you tell, the more core books we move, uh, the better off we'll all be. Uh, right now we've got, I just did my last count, I think we have 172 uh, SKUs, including uh, card decks for the game. And I mean, that might be enough, but... I have ideas for 40 more things at least. So I'd like to keep it going. And as long as you guys are having fun and consuming the products, we'll keep doing it. So, so, yeah. so I'm a, I'm getting really into like painting and miniatures and all that stuff. Do you ever envision like maybe like a mini line for Shadow of the De- Demon Lord? Uh, it's something I've talked, uh, I've thought about. Um, I'm going to probably, I've had a few conversations. Um, We'll see. Maybe I'd love to. I'd love to see what a ghastly cool. chorus would look like as a as a mini, or uh, the yeah. was the, the the muttering maw. Or the, yeah, mm-hmm. some really interesting things could come out of it. The the um the harvesters would be kind oh, yeah. of an awesome awesome miniature. Oh yeah, <laughs> I like those guys. Cool. Well, thanks for taking some time to meet with us and answer some questions. My pleasure, guys. Thanks for doing for all you guys do to support the game and keeping the and keeping the keep, keeping people aware of it. I really appreciate it. Yeah. If you uh, if and if we're ever driving through Tennessee, we'll uh, we'll try to show up at your door and see if we can play a game or two. Hell yeah, we'll make it happen. That'd be fun. We're, yeah, we're in Virginia, kind of in the D.C. area. So if you're ever, ever up this way, give us a ring. Yeah. All right. Sounds Absolutely. good. Absolutely. All, right, all right. Thank you so much, Rob. We appreciate it. Thanks. Yeah.